in our Sunday school class, A Theology of Public Life, Lessons for Lot in the City of Sodom. And we are um, working through our first section of this study. I'm dealing with a, a theology, if you will, we're working toward a theology of Christian resistance, but here determining um, the Christian's relationship to the state. And one of the critical texts that we look at when we're um, working out a theology of our relationship to the civil authorities is uh, Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, a pivotal text, a really important text, very helpful text, but also a very misunderstood, misinterpreted text. And so we want to take our time, work through uh, the, what the Spirit of God is, is teaching us there in these verses, and make sure that we understand it correctly so that it can be applied correctly. Okay, so I want to begin reading the text and then give a brief review before we get into uh, the rest of our study of this this morning. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister to a, uh, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you, pay, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. All right, now, I've been working through this text, and something we're calling uh, writing wrongs from Romans, uh, wanting to correct some misunderstandings, misconceptions about this text as we go. We've been discussing point one in this text, uh, the source of governmental authority, the source of governmental authority. We see that in verse one, and Paul is stating here, uh, a prevailing principle of Scripture. Verse 1 describes the heart disposition of the Christian. Uh, the heart disposition of the Christian should be uh, submission to civil authorities, uh, literally the higher or surpa surpassing authorities. Uh, this describes the heart disposition of the Christian, subject to governing authorities. Verse 1 also, by implication, describes the proper disposition, if you will, of the civil authorities as well. They are subject or submissive to a higher authority. They don't exercise or wield um, an autonomous authority. Um, they are subject or submissive to the one who appointed them, uh, the one from whom their authority comes. Uh, they do not technically govern by the consent of the governed. We've talked about that phrase before. Uh, rather, they govern by the consent of God. Uh, and that is um, a general principle, a general rule that uh, it works throughout the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. All authority is derived from God. All authority is delegated by God. So the authority of a husband in the home, delegated by God, and is to be exercised within the bounds that God has appointed. Uh, authority uh, at the workplace, for example, or authority uh, over the family, um, certainly authority uh, in government, civil authorities, all have their authority delegated to them by God and are to exercise their authority as accountable agents of God. And we'll talk about that more as we go. All right. In discussing implications then in Romans 13, specifically in verse 1, we considered two hermeneutical principles that are material to understanding this text. And hermeneutics is the study of biblical interpretation, the art and science, you might say, of biblical interpretation. And there are two principles that we studied uh, to help us understand a text like this. One is the analogy of faith, the analogy of faith. Other clear texts in the Bible being brought to bear on less clear texts in the Bible. The Bible helping us interpret and understand the Bible. And that's not circular reason, reasoning. The, the reality is, is the Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture, and the Holy Spirit is the best 
uh, inspired interpreter of scripture. So we want to understand one text, we go to other texts to try to understand that. Um, and there are other texts that should be brought to bear on this one. Uh, the second hermeneutical principle is good and necessary inference. And good and necessary inferences, as we spoke of last week, are binding. They're necessary and binding uh, when drawn from the text. Good and necessary inference. We'll look at those more today. All right, we made several observational assertions from the text. First, civil governments do not exercise an absolute or autonomous authority. Civil governments do not exercise an absolute or autonomous authority. There was um, a doctrine uh, that became popularized in... uh, 12th century, 13th century, 14th century and beyond called the doctrine of kings or the divine right of kings. Uh, We don't hold it to that. The the king has absolute or autonomous authority. God has absolute authority. All authority has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew 28, and that authority has been delegated to civil authorities and they are to rule in accord with his law. Civil governments, one, do not exercise an absolute or autonomous authority. Secondly, Romans 13 does not teach, therefore, that we owe unlimited obedience to the government. Does not teach that we owe unlimited obedience to the government. Three, there are circumstances in Scripture in which disobedience to civil government is commanded or commended. Now, that's where we call upon the analogy of faith, look at other passages of Scripture where disobedience to civil authorities is uh, commanded or commended, um, and that helps us to understand better what we read here in Romans 13. Four, those circumstances are not the fault of the institution which God has decreed or ordained um, to which we are to be subject, but they are uh, in response to the sinful practice of tyrants, sinful, fallen, fallible men who sin in their exercise of God-given authority and become uh, tyrants. Now, from the perspective of the government, first, civil authorities have a stewardship from God to govern as he has called them to govern. Civil authorities um, are to govern in the way that God has decreed. Second, they must govern according to the standard by which they must be judged, which is, as we talked about last week, the law of God. And third, the church, the pillar and ground of the truth, is given the declarative authority to proclaim his word even to civil authorities, especially to civil authorities. And we'll see that more as we go. Okay. This is just a brief review for us to think about, right? We established three areas in which the Christian must obey God rather than men. And these things, these three are three areas that I want you to remember. If we can uh, commit these to memory, it's going to help us. Three areas in which Christians must obey God rather than men. First, when civil government commands something that God forbids. We looked at several examples of that. Second, when civil government forbids something that God commands. We're to obey God rather than men. And then third, when civil government exercises an illegitimate authority outside the God-given parameters of its jurisdiction. And that's why we took a couple of weeks there to look at the principle, the biblical principle of jurisdiction, speaking the law into a specific area, into a sphere of authority, as it were. And civil government, when civil government exercises an illegitimate authority outside of its own jurisdiction and begins pouring over its boundaries into the jurisdiction of another, um, the Christian should resist. Uh, We'll talk about that more. But one of the reasons why that is the case is because um, the government begins to, in doing that, if any of us do that, if, if, if I as a pastor began to exercise an authority that doesn't legitimately belong to me, overspilling the bounds of God-given authority that God has given to pastors and elders in the church, and began to encroach upon the responsibilities of, for example, let's say fathers in the household, I have now exercised authority in an illegitimate way. And what am I doing? I am diminishing the authority of that husband in his own household and taking away from the responsibility that he has before God to lead his household well. Does that make sense? So if I take those, for example, um, many today have uh, sort of accused uh, modern day churches of um, usurping the role of a husband 
in the household by educating their children in the Bible. And the husband delegates that authority to the church by sending his kids to Sunday school or VBS and not doing it himself, right? Okay, there's, there's a legitimate complaint or a legitimate beef that may be made there if that's the case. Why? Because a husband, a wife, a mom and dad are responsible for the education of their children, in particular, the religious education, especially that, raise up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so if the church then usurps that stewardship of the husband in his own home, um, then the church has overstepped its bounds. Uh, it's wielding an authority that it doesn't have. The husband has given up an authority that he has in the home, which is also illegitimate. It shouldn't be done. Um, so... That's the purpose of that third statement. When civil government, when any delegated authority, exercises an illegitimate authority outside the God-given parameters of its jurisdiction, jurisdiction that should be resisted. Uh, in particular, we're speaking of when the civil government does that, it becomes tyrannical. Uh, what we see today is a glaring example of that. All right, any questions about that so far? Okay, uh, these spheres of authority, very important, and we have to maintain sphere distinctions, sphere boundaries, and the Lord uh, gives us clear instruction in his word with respect to that. Okay, any questions, thoughts? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, we must refuse to give civil government any authority that doesn't properly belong to it. Um, to do so, to give government authority that doesn't properly belong to it is to abandon the responsibility and accountability that God has given elsewhere. All right, let's build on these assertions from Romans 13 and point two then on your notes. We've got an outline, point two. We've talked about the source of governmental authority. Let's talk about the substance of governmental authority, the substance of governmental authority. Verse two, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Right? Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. All right, first, um, Paul's referring to conduct, right? Referring to conduct. He'll, we'll talk about conduct, consequence, and connection. Those are our three headings under this point. Conduct, consequence, and connection. First, let's talk about conduct. Whoever resists the authority. Well, what is the authority that Paul's referring to? The authority is that surpassing or higher authority that he mentions in verse one that is established by God, especially or particularly here, civil authority, right? Civil government. So then the one who defies, opposes, sets himself against the authority, defies, opposes, or sets himself against the ordinance of God. That word ordinance there meaning law. Um, and setting himself against the ordinance of God, that ordinance of God in line with God's own character, he therefore defies, opposes, or sets himself against God. Do you see? Right? Higher authorities, civil authorities are established, they're appointed, decreed by God. Therefore, whoever opposes that authority established by God sets himself in opposition to God himself. They're, so, they're not simply to resist the authority, um, to not be subject, verse 1, is not simply to defy a court order or defy a local ordinance. It certainly is defying a court order or defying a local ordinance. It's not simply opposing a Washington bureaucrat <laughs> for something a Washington bureaucrat may do or say. Uh, it's not simply opposing a single police officer. You get pulled over and... You resist the authority. <laughs> they are defying the law or direction of God and therefore standing opposed to God himself. That's what Paul is saying in, in verse two, right? Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. Those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. They're defying the law. They're defying the direction, the decree, the determined will of God uh, for those whom he has established in authority. And we see examples of that um, all over the place right now in our cultural context, don't we? You turn on the news and what's the, the latest example of resisting authorities? Uh, and that takes place in all, in many shapes and forms, obviously, but not the least of which is resisting arrest or resisting the authority that the police have. And there's all kinds of ways that the police right now are being undermined in their authority. That doesn't excuse um, sinful or um, tyrannical 
exercise of power on the police, on the part of police officers, those who may do evil, but it certainly doesn't excuse the resistance of governing authorities on the part of people who resist the police or resist arrest. We see it all over the place in the news right now, this resistance of authority. And the undermining of authority takes place um, not just with police, but also with governing authorities, with local authorities. The one who resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God, resists God himself. We are to be subject to the authority. We're to be submissive to the authority. The heart disposition of the Christian is to be submissive. So when we're confronted with authority, when we're approached by authority, when we come in contact with a higher or surpassing authority, verse 1, the heart disposition of the Christian is to be ready to submit, to, to be ready to, to have a heart disposition of subjection to that authority. Now, I would submit to you that would get people out of a whole lot of trouble if that heart disposition would prevail in our country. We can always deal with authoritarian or tyrannical exercise of authority in other ways. We have other ways of dealing with that. Um, and it may, there may be circumstances in which fleeing is an appropriate way to deal with tyrannical exercise of authority or resistance is a uh, a legitimate way to deal with the tyrannical exercise of power. But most of what we're seeing now is, is neither of those. Uh, it's just a, a resistance of God-given authority. And as a result of that, what do you see in our country? You see crime rates absolutely going through the roof all over the place. What happens when you undermine the authority? God's minister for good and avenger on those who do evil. When you undermine that authority, evildoers run rampant. <laughs> Evil doers have their way. They wreak havoc, right? We are to be subject to governing authorities. All right. So he talks about context, conduct, whoever resists the authority. Then Paul moves on to consequence. Whoever sets himself against the authority by default sets himself against the ordinance of God and consequence will therefore bring judgment upon himself. Not just the judgment of the civil authorities, but the judgment of God as well. And that judgment, the judgment of civil authorities, that is an appropriate and a legitimate exercise of governing authority is to, as Paul would say, exercise wrath. <laughs> um, he is God's minister and avenger, verse four, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. That's a legitimate practice of government, of civil authority, is a wielding of those penal sanctions necessary to punish the evildoer and restrain wickedness. Therefore, Paul says, verse 5, you must be subject. So it's not just the judgment of the civil authorities that we'll, we'll be under, that you'll experience, but also you bring yourself under the judgment of God as well. Those who resist the ordinance of God, those who resist God, are brought under the judgment of God. Now, where we see in our own country today um, a continuous undermining of that judgment on the part of civil authorities, uh, there will be no undermining God's judgment, right? No undermining of God's judgment. Uh, what do we see today? We see um, everywhere, let me give you an example, a legitimate, a legitimate, and we'll talk about this in a minute, a legitimate exercise of civil authority exercising wrath as a minister of God for good is the death penalty. And we'll see that in a moment from Genesis chapter six, but that's a legitimate biblical exercise of civil authority. But what do we see everywhere? We see the death penalty undermined, taken away, uh, removed, dissolved, uh, decried as evil, decried as wicked. Um, and who is that being done by? wicked, fallible, sinful men who despise the judgment of God, right? There's a reason that wicked, sinful men undermine the authority. It's because they don't want it, right? They don't want that authority over them. Uh, in all kinds of ways, authorities are being undermined. That coming under, uh, uh, people come under the, the judgment of civil authorities. So what do they do? They undermine or remove the judgment. Make sense? And that's what we see. Defund the police is a perfect example of that very issue, right? Uh, rather than come under the judgment of the authority, we'll do away with the authority. We'll abandon the, the authority. We'll defund the authority. Um, ridiculously reduced or commuted sentences is another example of that. Uh, releasing criminals under the um, 
the, um, the guise or the deceit of it costs too much money or whatever the case may be. All of this, all of this, um, reducing the, the sentences for certain crimes over other crimes, you know, uh, it's just an effort on the part of sinful, wicked people to undermine the authority and undermine the judgment that evildoers rightly come under when they commit offenses against the authority. Uh, there should be punishments that fit the crime. Now, it does not excuse punishments that don't fit the crime, either extreme, right? It's too light or too serious or too grievous. Um, but the uh, civil authorities are to justly wield and exercise that authority of judgment upon evildoers. When they do not, what ensues as a result? Chaos, anarchy, and frankly, what ensues beyond chaos and anarchy is tyranny, and we get the very same problem, the very same issue arising. And that's all, brothers and sisters, all biblical. Uh, those biblical principles exist for a reason. They exist to bring law and order to citizenry, to people, to fallen mankind. And it's for the purposes of accomplishing God's will, for implementing God's ordinance in the kingdoms of men. And when that is undermined, we see chaos, anarchy, tyranny, um, tyrannical governments, despotic governments arise under those kinds of conditions. There are many right now, if you read uh, modern day sociologists, many right now who say that a form of despotic or tyrannical authoritarian socialism is inevitable for our country. And one of the reasons that they would say that it's inevitable for our country is because of the rising chaos and anarchy in our streets, uh, in our inner cities, in our communities, right? Uh, and those two things go hand in hand. The more that we see lawlessness, the more that we see law and order break down, the more that we will eventually see a rise of tyranny. Robinson. Yes. Just to affirm what you're saying, I think this very week, a uh, government official says that we should have less jail and less prison so yep. we can have less crime. So it's that twisted thinking about um, yeah. government authority. Exactly the opposite is true, you know, <laughs> right? But the more and more lawless that our country becomes, um, the more and more we'll hear cries for that. And what is um, shameful and a, a, a devastating testimony to the depravity of man is that the more and more bad fruit, bitter fruit that those policies produce, uh, the more and more entrenched in their policies they become. It's uh, in just abject um, ignorance. Uh, it's like um, the definition of insanity, right? This thing isn't working. We're gonna keep doing, keep doing it in hopes that it will work. Uh, it's just against the law of God, against what we see, and that's, a good and necessary inference, what you're talking about, Robin said, a good and necessary inference from Romans chapter 13, in particular, verse one and two, um, when governments are accountable to God for doing that very thing. And yet we see governments, uh, people uh, undermining those institutions left and right. So yeah, what's, what's happening in that respect is really, really tragic, really, really dangerous. And uh, it's, um, it appears as though that's going to continue to persist. Um, there could be a backlash. We've seen backlashes to those things in the past. We'll see. Uh, the Lord is sovereign over all those things. All right. Consequence. Conduct, consequence. Whoever resists, whoever sets himself in opposition against the authority, against the authority sets himself in opposition to God himself, will bring himself under judgment, not just the judgment of civil authorities, but under the judgment of God as well. Next, I want you to notice a connection then, a connection, verse two. This is a good and necessary inference, all right? Good and necessary inference. There is an implied and binding connection between the authority of the civil government and the ordinance of the law, ordinance or law of God, right? Let me repeat that. There is an implied and a binding connection between the authority of the civil government and the ordinance or law of God. Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And that presupposes that the authority is exercising, implementing, upholding, sustaining the ordinance of God, right? What happens when a civil authority doesn't apply, exercise the ordinance of God, right? This presupposes a binding connection between the authority of the civil government and the ordinance or law of God. 
Governments that are appointed by God, accountable to God, responsible to God, have no authority outside of or contrary to the ordinance of God, right? Governments have no authority outside the ordinances of God. Just as, for example, a husband has no authority out in his home, over his wife, over his children, has no authority outside the bounds of what God has delegated to him, right? He cannot operate contrary to the ordinance of God. He can't operate contrary to the principles of God's law, God's will, against God's direction, God's decree. In other words, the husband in his own home should exercise his, th his authority in keeping with biblical principles, in keeping with God's law, a, God, a good, godly, sacrificially loving husband will operate in his home in a way that brings honor to the Lord, in a way that adorns the gospel, in a way that upholds biblical principles and does not stand contrary or opposed to them. Does that make sense? In the same way, an elder or a pastor in the church, right? Uh, um, an elder or a pastor in, church, in the church has no authority outside the bounds of what God has decreed or determined for elders in the church. We're to operate in harmony with, in symphony with um, those decrees, determinations of God uh, for his purposes and intentions in the church. Um, that which is apart from the mandate with which God has decreed that they should govern is by its nature unlawful. That which is apart from the mandate which God has decreed is unlawful. It's tyrannical. It's sinful. Um, it is a, an authoritarian uh, exercise of power, an illegitimate exercise of power. It's unlawful. Paul says to Timothy, doesn't he, that uh, whoever uses the law lawfully, is, the law is good for the one who uses it lawfully. Uh, what about the one who uses it unlawfully, right? That doesn't mean that the only laws that a government may enact are those that we can explicitly find in the Bible. In other words, uh, that means the only laws in the United States that we can have are the Ten Commandments <laughs> and laws that flow from the Ten Commandments. No, it doesn't mean that that's the, th those are the only laws that a government can enact. But the laws that governments do enact um, should be in harmony with God's intention for the civil authorities to be a minister for good, to an avenger of evil, to execute wrath on those who... Um, resist the ordinance, resist the authority. They are to be ministers of God for good. When a government fails to do that, it's, it forfeits its authority in that particular area, it may forfeit its authority altogether. It's unlawful. I remember um, uh, years ago, uh, we had a young man, prideful man, but young, um, immature, and he was leaving our church, uh, not leaving on the best of, of grounds. And I remember him uh, saying to me, we had um, gone through a, a difficult period, and him saying to me that the only thing, for example, for example, the only thing that elders or pastors in a church can do is to proclaim to you the commandments of God. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. Apart from that, we have zero authority. Our declarative authority is only or merely for repeating or being mouthpieces for um, those uh, commandments. And so for a pastor, for example, to say to someone, yeah, I, I think you're embittered. It seems like you've been um, uh, tangled up in the sin of bitterness. And maybe you should examine your heart, examine your motives. Let's help you work through this. Issue. We can't do that. Right? We can't judge anyone's motives. Uh, we can't discern anyone's motives or desires or intentions. Uh, we can't um, apply the laws of God in preaching to the people. We can only parrot the laws of God in preaching to the people. In other words, a, a, an incredibly restrictive view of what God intends for the preaching of God's word and the application of God's word. One meeting or one interpreted meaning to a particular text, for example, but many applications, right? And we all, we all need to be about applying the scriptures to our own personal circumstances in the wisdom of God. That's the way he has uh, determined his word, decreed his word. To apply that to the government, someone might say, well, then the only laws that the government can ever impose are laws that we actually find in the black and white text of scripture, 
And that's simply uh, not the case, um, that governments can and should have all kinds of laws as they exercise the authority given them by God to be a minister for good. And so we're not going to find, for example, in governments, uh, laws against polyester or eating shellfish. Heaven forbid, we can't have all-you-can-eat shrimp night at crossroads. <laughs> like, uh, we won't find those laws in our civil governments, and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that we should be striving to do away with the laws that we have and impose those laws. There were laws for the theocracy of Israel, the government of Israel, that shouldn't be imposed today. This is not the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is not his kingdom. This is the United States of America. Uh, uh, he, his kingdom is not of this world, right? Uh, those laws shouldn't, like the, the theonomist or the reconstructionist might say, shouldn't be applied in our country today. Um, however, the laws that our government does uh, apply, that they do enact, that legislation should be in harmony with God's word, God's law all the time. God, government is responsible and accountable to do what is lawful in God's sight. And when government, civil authorities, do what is unlawful in God's sight, Christians should be proclaiming God's word against that as the pillar and ground of truth. Uh, we should call that out when you see it. And uh, Christians may be called upon to resist that as tyrannical and authoritarian. Okay. Governments are acting lawfully then when they, for example, verse 4, bear the sword and avenge evil. Governments are acting lawfully when they impose and enforce fear-provoking penalties on evildoers. Uh, that's the meaning of that phrase. Uh, do you want to be afraid? <laughs> you want to not be afraid? Right? The, the government has a responsibility before God to... Um, put in place fear-provoking penalties against wickedness. Uh, in other words, um, the punishment needs to have a bit of teeth in it in order for punishment to be effective. Anyone who has ever raised a child knows that to be true. Um, the first time that I lovingly, uh, in harmony with the law of God, spanked my daughter and she smiled at me, it was an indication to me that something is amiss in my execution of wrath <laughs> uh, to avenge an evildoer. <laughs> and I needed to increase the authority that I was wielding in order to exact the correct response. Okay? Uh, anyone who has kids knows that to be true. Okay? They're to impose and enforce fear-provoking penalties on evildoers. When they, um, they are to legislate and do that which is good for the people, verse 4. They're to legislate and do that which is good for the people. And they exercise a lawful authority when they impose taxes, verse 6, in order to keep up with all that they do, verse 6. Other examples, we talked about the death penalty. The death penalty, um, we find that in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, meant to protect life. But what is the death penalty? How does the death penalty protect life? It does so by restraining murder, doesn't it? By implementing a fear-provoking penalty on anyone who would consider uh, that wickedness. So it protects life by restraining murder. Uh, moving your neighbor's landmark, protecting property, property rights, to restrain theft. And we'll talk about this beginning next week, uh, protecting inalienable rights. The government exercises a lawful authority when it labors, strives to protect inalienable, God-given, non-transferable rights. Uh, the government should be protecting those. And right now, the government is undermining those left and right. Uh, much of what our government does today is entirely lawful, according to God's ordinance. So you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Most of what the government does today, most of what governments do around the world is entirely lawful. You could say most of what the Roman government was doing at the time of Paul's writing was entirely lawful, things that governments should be doing. But there has been much that our government has done already, much that other governments, much that the Roman government uh, was doing, had done, that was explicitly, overtly, shamefully unlawful, right? And that's where uh, Christians are called to uh, respond, I think. Okay, let me give, ask some questions. Uh, 
Does God give blanket approval then of all laws enacted by the civil authorities that he has ordained? Does God give blanket approval to any law civil government wants to come up with? No, right? Obviously not. Are some laws enacted by civil authorities then against the ordinance of God? Yes. Uh, the absolute over deplorable um, approval of abortion in this country, country is unconscionable. Um, but all kinds of laws leading up to that, unconscionable as well. I, I keep going back to Ronald Reagan's decision to approve um, at will divorce in this country, a, tr a horrible, horrible decision. Um, so there have been many laws in our country that have been passed that have been wicked. Um, then let me ask you, are you resisting the ordinance of God when you resist those laws? No, no, okay. See the connection there. So we have to then qualify the principle that Paul is giving us in Romans 13. We do that through analogy of the faith, good and necessary inference. God does not give blanket approval to all the laws that a government or a civil authority appointed by him passes. He doesn't give blanket approval. Some of those laws that civil authorities pass are against the ordinance of God and against God himself. And so then it is not only commendable, I think commanded, that God's people then resist that ordinance that is against the ordinance of God. Um, we are not resisting God when we resist those ordinances. Now, those issues like abortion, um, no-fault divorce, things like that are obvious, very overt, very clear to the Christian. Uh, it becomes less so when we whittle down uh, to some of the laws that are passed. Um, for example, mask ordinances in church, uh, ordinances passed with respect to worship, respect without, to res with respect to how a church functions or operates, those become a little more challenging, and we'll talk about those more clearly as we go. Um, however, uh, you are not resisting the ordinance. You are not resisting God when you resist uh, the ordinance of man in one of those three areas. When... For example, civil government commands something that God forbids, when civil government forbids something that God commands, or, this is the clincher, when civil government exercises an illegitimate authority outside the God-given parameters of its own jurisdiction. When a government begins to exercise authority, a tyrannical, illegitimate authority outside of its own jurisdiction, it is not resisting the ordinance of God to resist that overreach of government. And we'll talk about that more, okay? Uh, to resist laws unlawfully imposed by men is to resist evil men and not to resist God. The civil government has no authority to impose unlawful ordinances. And when we say unlawful, we really have two trains of thought on that. The, the, the unlawful that we're concerned with is unlawful in the sight of God. Unlawful when it comes to scripture. Um, there are arguments that could be made um, with respect to laws that are passed is that they are unlawful with respect to our constitution. And that's another issue altogether. But you have two trains of thought that may come into play there. Um, when it comes to unlawful ordinances and our concern with scripture, uh, what is the standard? The standard is God's word, not the ordinances of men, right? Not the thinking or philosophies of men, but the ordinances of uh, the ordinance of God. Okay, we're about to go on to point three. Let me ask if there are any questions with respect to any of that so far that we can help with or talk about. Okay. Oh, Ben, yes, sir. Um, I don't have the text with me right now, but like in... First Peter, where all that suffering is going on. Yeah. How does that jive with, with what Peter's talking about there, where yeah, you know, people are suffering at the hands of seemingly government or authorities. Yeah. You know, and that's uh, First Peter in particular, a really fascinating application of this. We may take some time in First Peter. First Peter, Peter repeats almost word for word what Paul is speaking of here in, in Romans chapter thirteen, uh, where Peter says to submit to or to be subject to governing authorities. And Peter is writing to whom in First Peter? Might remember? 
dispersed, <laughs> dispersed Jew, Jews of the, the diaspora who were dispersed because of persecution from whom? The civil authorities, right? So, uh, amazing, isn't it? Now, these these uh, are, are um, uh, Jewish professing, Christ, ethnically Jewish Christians dispersed abroad because of persecution by civil authorities and Peter is exhorting them in 1 Peter to be submissive, to be subject to civil authorities in the same way that Paul is from Romans 13. Um, the heart disposition of that one is to be submissive, to be subject to governing authorities. But even their um, fleeing, their dispersion is a refusal to be subject to unlawful civil authority uh, are, it, it exercises itself in terms of persecution where they're from. Uh, you know, we see examples of that. For example, um, thought came through my mind of uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11 into chapter 12, where in the Hall of Faith, um, those believers, um, uh, Paul says there, uh, joyfully accepted the plundering of their goods, the plundering of their own lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. What were persecuting civil authorities doing with Christians at that time? Plundering their goods, plundering their homes, plundering their own lives, plundering their families. What was Paul doing when he was converted on the road to Damascus, Acts 9? He had papers <laughs> written up. He was on his way to Damascus to do what? To arrest people of the way, dragging them back to either imprisonment or death, even women and children. And Paul, when they were brought up and the death penalty was announced, senting to their death, right? Um, what is a Christian to do? Now, those, again, those are overt cases. What do Christians do? Christians resist. Christians protest. When Christians are unable to resist or protest, the Bible clearly tells us to flee persecution. And that's what started the diaspora, right? Uh, in particular, uh, the diaspora after Stephen's uh, martyrdom in the temple in Acts chapter 7, it says that the believers were scattered everywhere. The only ones who stayed behind were the disciples, the apostles, but believers were scattered everywhere. They went everywhere preaching the gospel, uh, facing more persecution for it obeying God rather than men and their preaching of the gospel. But Christians resist. They protest when they can't resist or protest. Um, they flee uh, when Christians historically have been unable to flee. Christians fight. Uh, Christians um, defend. Okay. But um, to, to Ben's point, uh, really good, I think in uh, 1 Peter in, in particular, we can see examples throughout the Bible where although we're told to have this disposition of submission to civil authorities, Christians are resisting. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at those texts, uh, those, some of those examples in the Bible, and find out, uh, look at what are the circumstances behind that Christian resistance um, um, and uh, the nature of that Christian resistance so that we can understand for ourselves how we might respond in our own context. And I think that's really, really important, um, important connection. Uh, there, a lot of times people will say, um, and I've heard it before where, you know, Rome was just this wicked, tyrannical government and Christians were uh, to submit regardless, right, to the governing authorities. There, there are many professing Christians who hold that Romans 13 calls for an unequivocal uh, uncompromising obedience to everything the civil authorities command, except for this sort of direct contradiction to God's word. And yet, under those governments, you see Christians going to their death, dragged off to the Colosseum, arrested, imprisoned, all of the apostles arrested and imprisoned, um, eventually killed, uh, John exiled, you know. Um, so I think it's really important point to be made that... Um, the Christian testimony is a testimony of resistance. <laughs> and it's a resistance, a resistance to authoritarian, tyrannical governing authority that is not in harmony with God's word. What should civil authorities be doing? Upholding the ordinance of God. But what do civil authorities end up doing in their tyranny? They undermine the ordinance of God. And what happens? Christians are persecuted, right? When Christians are persecuted, um, they have limited choices uh, in front of them. Um, any other thoughts, questions about that? Yes, Dr. Carl. I'm, I'm considering Rahab, who's in the Hall of Faith. Yeah, very good. And her interactions with civil government. And I don't think I've ever had a, I'm not sure that I've had a proper understanding of 
her lying to the government um, yeah. openly and then having a qualify for the Hall of Faith. Mm -hmm. And so this, and I think the answer lies slap dab in the middle of this doctrine of the um, lesser magistrates. I do too. And, and how far it, can we biblically go in our apparent violation of commandments in, mm -hmm. in, in our interactions with civil government? Like, for instance, can we um, qualify for the Hall of Faith, so to speak, <laughs> and not pay our taxes mm -hmm. um, or condone civil war? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can we, can we conceive of circumstances under which uh, not paying your taxes may be a very real consideration for genuine Christians when the Bible says pay taxes to whom taxes are due, right? Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Can we conceive of circumstances where it may be necessary for, I think so, I think so. Um, can we conceive of circumstances where Christian resistance uh, may result in civil war or revolution? I think we can. I think we've seen that already in our own revolution, right? That, that birthed our country, so to speak. Um, so I, I think we can conceive of circumstances like that. And I think it's important for Christians not to be naive and thinking through those things. Oh, that never happened here. It's happened in our very recent past, you know, and, and there may be circumstances. What would anyone here have faulted the German people for rising up in revolution, in civil war, against Hitler uh, at the time of the Civil War. Would anyone have thought that was an unjust, unbiblical, ungodly thing to do? I can't imagine that that would be the case, right? That somebody would actually say that. Um, and that is in our very, very recent history, right? Um, and so to your point about Rahab, um, it's interesting. Uh, the Bible, in the case of Rahab, another example that comes to mind is the Hebrew midwives who lied about the children, um, the, um, the, uh, the wise men who refused, refused to obey Herod when he was after the, all the children under two, you know, um, or Herod killed all the children under two, uh, you know, those, those circumstances. Um, it's interesting that the Bible doesn't uh, overtly or explicitly um, approve of the lie per se, but it does approve of the actions of the, the people um, by commending them. You know, um, Rahab is put into the hall of faith uh, because of her actions, her conduct. And um, I think Rahab is a commendable figure in protecting those spies in the way that she went about that. The Bible doesn't overtly condone her lie, but it does commend her conduct. And I think that um, Christians... Um, uh, we'll have to consider those things. You know, the, the question comes up every now and then, if it were you or I in Europe during the Second World War, um, we were hiding Jewish people in our attics or basements, protecting them against uh, the Germans, and you know, we get a knock on the door, or more probably appropriately pounding on the door at 3 a.m. from, you know, the Gestapo uh, coming to that. Um, what would we have done? Would we have overtly lied? I'm going to tell you that, yes, I'm going to lie. There are, there is no one in my attic. <laughs> there is no one. And, um, we're putting the, the, put in these, uh, these positions and I'm not, I'm not, uh, um, suggesting that, um, that we believe in or would hold to, you know, situational ethics, compromising the word of God, not in any way. Um, uh, but I would say that again, Rahab, the Hebrew midwives commended for their actions, Rahab in the hall of faith. And I'm going to follow the example of those commended in scripture. You know, if, if I'm in a situation, um, and I think that's, that's incumbent upon us in, in developing or cultivating a theology of public life is looking at those examples in scripture and forming our understanding. We're not going to be able to do that from explicit yes and no statements in the Bible. The Bible is just not communicated to us in those terms. We are going to be able to do that by looking at what the Bible clearly commends in the actions of those that resist and how they do it. And uh, that's very clear in scripture. And uh, um, we'll be able to, I think, cultivate our own understanding of those things from biblical examples. Hopefully that helps, brother. It's, um, those are, um, in one sense, difficult because we know clearly what the law of God says. In one sense, not difficult because we see their conduct, their behavior um, very clearly commended uh, as a good thing in the Bible. And we should, we should follow their examples, right?
Paul, Paul routinely resisting the authorities, running, you know, fleeing, routinely resisting authorities. We should follow Paul's example when necessary, right? And not, not follow, um, you know, again, sort of the, the vain wranglings of our own. Like if we don't want to pay, I don't want to pay taxes. I'm going to find something. There have been people who, you know, found biblical justification for not paying taxes. It's absurd. And that's just ungodly wickedness. It's, um, that's, that's not what we're to do. But can we conceive of circumstances that may arise where that question becomes legitimate? Yeah, I think we can. Uh, right Already. Uh, and again, it's a question that, that um, simply needs to be uh, thought through, I think. But uh, doing away with the Hyde Amendment and government support of abortion and using taxpayer dollars to pay for abortions and things like that, I think it's something that Christians should, should think about. Um, so any other questions or thoughts? Uh, things we can talk about or help with? Yes, Tyler. I was just, I'm still on First Peter. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about um, in the book of First Peter in uh, chapter two, like would you say um, it, it sounds like you were saying that First Peter two thirteen through seventeen, where it says, um, uh, let's see, submit yourselves uh, for the Lord's sake for, to every human institution, whether the king is the one in authority or to governors is sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, etc. It sounds like you were saying that that corresponds to um, Romans thirteen. Yeah, I think and, Peter's either been reading Paul or Paul was reading Peter. Yeah. <laughs> They've similar ideas. Well, would you say that uh, theology of resistance is in um, 1 Peter 5, yeah. where it says, uh, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety, which I imagine a temptation for anxiety is persecution. Yeah. Um, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So um, resist him. Resist him, yeah. yeah. But resist him, firm in your faith. Like, would you say that um, your adversary, the devil, who prowls around seeking someone to devour, is a reference to persecution? And therefore, our resistance to the devil looks like Christian um, resistance in yeah. the face of persecution against the civil magistrate? Yeah, I think so. And not only with specific reference to the civil magistrate, but certainly to persecution. And um, yeah, thank you, brother. Um, yeah, I see a, a connection between those two. Yeah, thanks, brother. It's good. Any other questions, thoughts? Okay, yes, Ben. Um, that's what I'm when you get to covering examples, um, would you consider the book of Esther in those examples as well, uh, where yeah. the Jews resist? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, Esther's a really good example. Yeah, thank you, brother. We'll look at that. Okay. We're out of time. I'm getting the red dot. Um, so <laughs> somebody tear those out of Andy's hand. Um, uh, another question? Or Oh, okay. Saw a hand up. Okay. All right. Well, we'll come back. We'll, um, we're going to look at then point three on your notes, uh, commitments and obligations. And maybe we'll try to get into some of those examples too next week. Uh, we'll look at that uh, next Lord's Day. Um, and, you know, keep, keep thinking through these. I, I think it would help if you take your outline, maybe some notes that you've taken, and um, go back through Romans chapter 13. And uh, sometimes, um, you know, at first blush or when we read through Scripture, um, you know, just taking in the Bible in a quick way maybe, over viewing those texts, um, those implications or inferences aren't always at the front of our mind. But I, I do believe that those um, good and necessary inferences combined with those correlating texts, the analogy of faith, really helpful for a good understanding of Romans 13. And I think we want to be able to have a, a clear picture of what is being said, what's not being said, and how other texts are brought to bear upon Romans 13. And if you've got a good, solid foundation in Romans 13, then 1 Peter is going to make more sense to you. Uh, all of these examples will make more sense to you going forward. And I think it'll be really helpful. So spend some time there if you've got it. And uh, let's pray for the Lord's help. Pray with me. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for your word. Um, thank you, Lord, for uh, just your infinite wisdom in uh, communicating your word to us in these ways um, so that we can, in our own circumstance, in our own time, um, forge a path here on biblical principles with your wisdom, your kind, good intention in mind, that we can um, be faithful in our own generation with a clear conscience before you. And with respect to how we are to respond to overreach or 
illegitimate authority on the part of civil government. And help us, Lord, as we consider these things. We admit uh, we have great need of wisdom and that we often uh, are like babes in these things. We don't know our right hand from our left and need your help, uh, Lord. So please illumine our understanding. Help us not to be self-willed uh, in these things, but to be... Um, um, focused on your will, submissive to your will. And Lord, help us as we do to maintain the very heart disposition that Paul is calling for here in Romans 13, a heart disposition of being subject, being submissive to gov governing authorities, knowing, Lord, that they are established by you. And we pray even now uh, in this, Lord, that for our governing authorities, that you would uh, bring about uh, repentance, uh, bring about, Lord, your will um, in governing authorities, that, Lord, you would be gracious to us and restraining um, their wickedness or restraining their overreach and help us, Lord, when it's in your will that they should not, uh, Lord, help us to, as Christians, uh, to know how to be faithful to you in um, living under their govern governance. Uh, we pray, Lord, for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven and rejoice that your will is good and perfect and clear and clean. And we rejoice, Lord, that your will is always right, your law, holy, just, and good. And pray for the day, Lord, when it will be um, in full implemented as you have decreed. For your glory, God, we pray these things and for the good of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>